thank you, PFTPM Posse, with some questions posed so uh, we can continue to talk about football while we – it's hard to do a draft with one person. This would be the time in the show where we would do our matchup draft for Week 15. Draft isn't as fun when it's just one person. It's just like one person playing checkers. It really isn't fun for anyone, including the person – playing checkers how about this question from coach Clough? for the next 10 years if he had to bet on super bowl outcomes would you take mahomes and the chiefs winning five out of ten or would you pick the field i did have a dream last night that the chiefs won this year not that that's any type of a stretch but we were covering it even though we're not going to be there. And Travis Kelsey, I think, has a really big game. And Andy Reid talking about hamburgers again. I don't know. I think this is just when your life starts to infiltrate your dreams. But the idea of the Chiefs winning isn't nearly as crazy as pretty much any other team in the league. The Chiefs, the favorite now, the betting favorite to win the Super Bowl. And even though I'm not a big fan of taking one team when I can take the field, when the field has 31 of them at this point in the season, I wouldn't have done it before week one. At this point in the season, I'll take the Chiefs for this year. Five out of the next ten, though, there's just too many things that can happen over the course of ten years. Injuries, other teams catching up. Maybe there's another Patrick Mahomes out there that's going to show up and level the playing field. Maybe that Patrick Mahomes is going to land in the AFC West and the Chiefs are going to face a tougher fight every year to try to get the best possible playoff positioning. Five out of the next ten, I'm taking the field versus the Chiefs. Uh, I, I just, we can't expect that to happen. The Patriots never got five out of 10. I have to go back and do my math. They had clusters of three out of four twice, but they were spread apart by 10 years. So even the Patriots with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick never won five in in 10 years. At Joe Paw 722, if the NFL expands to 17 games, will players make more money or will they play for the same amount per existing contract? Part of the negotiation back in March addressed that, I believe. There was so much going on in March with the pandemic and everything, but I think it's just as simple as taking their current contract and adding a week at their current rate. I believe that's what happens. And the other side of it, too, more money becomes more salary cap room, more salary cap space, more spending that can be done by the individual team. So the players currently not under contract or the players whose contracts will expire in the future will have more money that they can try to get in their individual negotiations. And also, if there's more cap space, that guy who's got the 5 or $6 million non-guaranteed contract who may have to worry about being cut, he doesn't have to worry about being cut, or at least not as much, if there's more cap space, because then there's less of an urgency to get that guy's cap number in line with what the cap is. So it's a win for the players. Yes, there are plenty of them that don't want to play a 17th game. There are real health and safety questions about whether or not it makes sense to expose players to that extra game. But there will be, without question, more money in the system to pay existing players, to pay rookies, to keep guys on the roster who otherwise would be potential cap casualties. Another one from Joe Paz, 72, who gets the number two seed in the AFC, the Bills or the Steelers? Right now, the Bills are 10 and 3, the Steelers 11 and 2. The Bills hold the head to head tiebreaker, and the Steelers still have the Colts and the Browns. One of the disappointments from Monday night, even though I picked the Ravens to win and I love being right, the reality is that uh, with the Browns losing, this late season possibility of the Browns catching the Steelers has gone out the window unless the Steelers would lose to the Bengals on Monday night. The Browns don't have a chance to win the division. The question is, do the Bills have a chance to catch the Steelers? I have a feeling, based on how the Steelers have been playing lately, they're going to lose one of these next two games. Now, that doesn't mean the Bills are going to run the table, but right now, I think the Bills are going to end up with a number two seed. And, you know, that may not be a good thing because the Ravens, if they get the number seven seed, I don't know that I want to mess with the Ravens in the wild card round. I'd love to see a Steelers-Ravens rematch. I'd love to see a Browns-Ravens rematch in the postseason. The Ravens, as we've said yesterday, they may be able to get past this question of whether or not they're going to fall flat on their faces in the playoffs by treating the final five games of the regular season like playoff games. They're going to be in playoff mode. They're not at home like they were in 2018 against the Chargers. They're not at home like they were in 2019 after a week off against 
the Titans. And remember, they shut it down for a lot of the key starters week 17. So it was three weeks between games for Lamar Jackson and some of the other key players. This year, there's the urgency. There's the panic, the desperation that contributes quite possibly to the Ravens being impervious to this question of whether or not they're going to fail in the postseason. They've already been winning playoff games. They've won five. What's one more or two more? or three more so they can be very dangerous i don't whatever the seating is round one wild card i don't want the ravens to be my draw if they get in another question from not your butler who is the 49ers quarterback of the future good question good question and you know i learned several years ago that anyone who says good question means i don't know so I'm going to buy some time and think about it while I say that's a good question. So can I say to you, not your butler, that was a very good question. Nobody knows who their quarterback is going to be. It shouldn't be Jimmy Garoppolo for one very specific reason. I know there's a lot of people out there. Why do you hate Jimmy Garoppolo? Look, I, I, I don't like – I don't hate Jimmy Garoppolo. I, I like quarterbacks who are able to play. And you can't be a franchise quarterback if you can't play. Now there's always a chance of a catastrophic injury that's going to knock you out like Tom Brady when he took a low hit week one of the 2008 season and wasn't able to play because he had a torn ACL. But this constant injury, 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 and so many games missed by Jimmy Garoppolo, and I understand that there's an explanation for every one of them, although for his ACL the explanation is he was trying to be tough guy along the sideline, dropping his shoulder and delivering a hit when he didn't need to, and he tore his ACL when he dropped his shoulder to deliver the hit to a Kansas City Chiefs defensive back. Just get out of bounds. Just just suppress the ego and the machismo and the urgency to prove to people that you're tough enough. You have to be able to play. And for Garoppolo, we haven't seen enough of him. And I think for that reason, they need to be looking at all options. And, you know, as Chris said the other day, you can't slam the door on Garoppolo unless you know who your plan B is. But at the same time, I don't know. At a certain point, you just say, we'll take our chances with plan B. Plan B is now plan A because plan A hasn't worked. We've tried it and it just hasn't been successful for us. Matt McSee, will the Steelers rest everyone for the final two weeks of the season after they clinch the division against Cincinnati? I don't know, but but, but, but why would you rest your your starters for the last two games? You've got the Colts. You've got the Browns. You, You I understand that the one seed make, well, I don't know. The one seed still potentially in play. I'm not a big fan of resting starters. I understand you're exposing your guys to risk. I, I, I just don't like it because you, 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 you potentially jeopardize your readiness for the playoffs. And if you're going to play in the wild card round anyway, there is some value maybe in considering shutting guys down for week 17, but I, I want to know exactly what the stakes are. If you truly have nothing to play for, maybe you consider resting guys week 17. I'm just not a big fan of that. I I say keep it going, keep it rolling. But for the Steelers, they've had such a weird year. Maybe they would benefit from a true bye week. They never had a bye week this year. Their bye week ended up being a week where they got ready to play the Bills. Or or was it the Titans? It was when they got ready to play the Titans, for crying out loud. Not the Bills. They just played the Bills this week. Their bye week was the week they spent getting ready to play the Titans, and then they didn't play the Titans, and they played the Titans three weeks after that. So they haven't had a true bye week. There may be value to it. I just just generally say be very careful about consciously pulling the plug on your team because sometimes it may be difficult to put the plug back in the socket when you need to. Another question, Rodri Jones, 32, will an offensive lineman ever win an AP award? Jason Kelsey deserved Offensive Rookie of the Year in his first season, I thought. I think Shereen Williams has said that she voted for Quentin Nelson of the Colts the year that he was a rookie for uh, the Indianapolis Colts. Um, I just don't think it ever happens because, look, this is the dynamic of football. When the offensive line is playing great, what does that do? It allows the quarterback the running backs, the receivers, the tight end, to have better seasons. So statistically, those players become the stars while the offensive linemen are grinding it out in relative anonymity. You typically only know about offensive linemen when they're not playing well and guys are running past them and you say, who the hell is that guy that is letting the defensive end continue to run past him and get to the quarterback? If they're playing well, unless it's spectacular, and I remember when the term pancake block entered the lexicon back in the 70s or the 80s and i remember when bill fraley remember that name was it Pitt? many of you don't 
the, the, the concept that he was just putting guys on their butts all the time. I mean, if you're doing something spectacular where you just steamroll a guy into the front row of the stadium, that's when you get noticed. That's when people pay attention to you as an offensive lineman. That just doesn't happen very often. It's more about, in today's game, pass blocking. How many offensive linemen are throwing guys onto their butts when they're pass blocking? It's more of a defensive posture where you're fending off the attacker and trying to steer him away from your quarterback. So it's just very difficult for an offensive lineman because when an offensive lineman is playing well, his teammates are playing well, and those are the people who will be getting the major awards. Kevin Kelly, what is the percentage chance Bill Belichick tanks Week 17 versus the Jets to screw them out of the first overall pick? You know, people have been throwing around that possibility, and – the Patriots are in a position that really they haven't been in in a long time. Matthew Slater, special teams captain, had to talk about where he finds his motivation. This is the first season of his career when he's playing out the string. You know, if if you truly don't want to spend the next 10 or 15 years dealing with Trevor Lawrence, and if you intend to continue to be the coach of the Patriots for the next 10 or 15 years, yeah, there's there's merit in laying down to the Jets. I, I'd be stunned if it happens. And, and I can't help but wonder, even if it's the Patriots B team or C team, would they still lose to the Jets? Could the Jets beat the back end of the Patriots roster? Because that's how tanking really happens. Nobody, nobody, nobody's really trying. The players aren't trying to lose. The team puts lesser players on the field and hope nature will take, take its course like the Buccaneers did in the final week of the 2014 season when at halftime they were leading the Saints by double digits they pulled all their good players they put their bad players in the Saints came back and won and the Buccaneers got Jameis Winston even though Jameis Winston ultimately didn't work out that's what they wanted to do that's what they did that's how it would work I don't know that Bill Belichick would do that but he's so strategic about everything if he doesn't want the Jets to get Trevor Lawrence and if it comes down to losing to the Jets week 17 to keep the Jets from getting Trevor Lawrence, and if the game has no impact whatsoever on the Patriots in any way, shape, or form, then yeah, why not do it? I mean, I've been saying for years now, once you know you're not going to get to the playoffs, who cares if you're 7-9 and nine or 6-10 and 10 or 5-11? and 11? Who cares? It's not like Bill Belichick has to worry about his job. You get a higher draft pick, and maybe you keep the Jets from getting Trevor Lawrence. So uh, whether he will or not, it's hard to make the argument that he shouldn't, especially if you're a Patriots fan that doesn't want to deal with Trevor Lawrence if he ends up being a great NFL quarterback. Gordo Cleveland, is Kevin Stefanski the greatest coach ever or the most handsome coach ever? I'll hang up and listen. Uh, well, uh, um, uh, Gordo, I don't, I don't know that we can really resolve either one of those yet. He's got a lot of competition on the latter category. On the former category, he's got a long way to go. But what he's done so far this year... As we've established and as we've discussed, he should be the favorite. We had the betting odds yesterday. If we have the graphic available and we can throw it up, that would be great. Mike Tomlin was the favorite, I believe, when we talked about it yesterday to be coach of the year. Kevin Stefanski was like plus 900, if I recall correctly, and there's a good chance I don't. I like the bet of Kevin Stefanski. I like the chances of Kevin Stefanski. I would vote for Kevin Stefanski as coach of the year. Nine and four right now having the Browns on the brink of the playoffs for the first time since 2002. And even though there was talent there, they didn't get it done last year. And he undid some damage, brought in some new systems without the benefit of an offseason program. He's turned that team around. I'm very impressed with what the Browns have done. And there it is, Mike Tomlin plus 175. And I was right, plus 900 for a change is Kevin Stefanski. A lot of great candidates, though, for Coach of the Year. This is one that's going to be determined based on what happens the last three weeks. And even then, even then, we're not going to know. And, and I've been advocating this for years. Associated Press, if you're listening, and there's a good chance you aren't, why, why do we do this one person, one vote for these awards? First place, second place, third place. Weight the votes that way. And then what it allows is a broader swath. You get more people who get recognition. So when the final numbers are tabulated, you get more people who who deserve recognition for a great season, getting votes. And this year, the vote could be all over the place for Coach of the Year. We'll see how that plays out. We're Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.